I just don't know where to start, except to warn you that in the profession as a whole, and I'm regarded as a heretic, um, somebody who isn't following all the rules about what architects and engineers should be and do. Um, the, uh, my upbringing, I mean my professional upbringing, was very, very different from yours. Um, for, for one thing, in my day, uh, architects were the big things. Um, we were the people who were in charge and legally responsible for the whole of the building, the drawing, the uh, workmen, and, the, uh, uh, and so on. And in our architectural course over the five years, um, we had a sort of mini engineering course parallel all the way through. And so at the end, when we qualified, we were supposed to be able to do our own uh, design, uh, structural designs, uh, for everything normal. If we were called, probably he was a brother in law of the architect. But then, if we only brought in the engineer very occasionally, and just to say, look, we're going to have a beam this big, um, do you really think, we're, because we're going to have a dancing uh, class up on top, whether it should be more, and that, that sort of thing. But now, of course, when I came to India, um, well over 50 years ago now, <laughs> Uh, everything was the other way around. It was the engineers who seemed the chief engineers of the PWD were the big wings, the really top dogs. And the architect was uh, somebody who was brought in, or was sort of pulled in with the other, to do a bit of work, you know, to give a nice front. And I used to be horrified when, um, in my first few years, uh, clients would come to me and say, um, Mr. Baker, we are building a, a church or a hospital or whatever it was. Please, would you do us a nice front? <laughs> well, if there's anything that I personally hate, and I hope you will, uh, a building should be uh, nice, all of it. It should be a, a complete whole, not just a front to impress people passing around the room. You see, again, you're on the whole, I discover that time and again, um, in school, you are taught that um, a four and a half inch wall is not reliable and not worth having. But um, I'm sorry if you, this is already old hat to you. If you've got a four and a half inch wall like that, oh, you don't, that's a nine inch wall, sorry. <laughs> um, if you've got a wall in the middle of the field standing up four and a half inches, a cow can come along and scrap its backside and the wall will go over. Or if you've got a strong wind, it'll blow it over. Or if you have a heavy roof on top of it, particularly if it's even a thatched roof of uh, straw and so on, when it gets wet, the weight, in, or the weight of the roof increases and the, the wall goes like that. But as soon as you do a fold like that, and put the wall like that, you can do that and it doesn't crush at all. And uh, again, the, uh, the tech of where I've seen anything written about uh, the wall, if you have a zigzag wall like that, all along here, instead of the nine inch wall, we could have done it. You will find that the calculations are done for the whole wall. Whereas in actual fact, all you have to calculate is this wall here because it is supported and um, you know buttressed by this wall here and this wall here so actually you're designing this bit of wall with a, a solid support at this end and a solid support at this end and it isn't to be treated in the you don't do your calculations in the same way as you would for a straight bit of wall like this and so on so there's all all this sort of thing has been partly because I've had to reduce costs. Um, the other very big thing that has always uh, worried me building here is this whole question of energy, fuel. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, some of you have heard me repeat this time and again. <laughs> but I, I just must make it clear, particularly to the ones who are new here. Um, we are compared with almost any other country in the world. 
Um, we have some coal over the West Bengal and uh, over that side, but um, to bring coal here, we haven't got the rolling stock, we haven't got the uh, rail, the rail uh, we potential to bring it in large enough quantities to use, say, for a thermal power station. Um, we could take it from West Bengal, we could take it to the sea, and then get their CITU people to load it into a boat, and then bring it all the way around the coast <laughs> here to uh, Calicut or wherever it would come, coaching. And uh, then you'd have the same trouble with the CITU and all the rest of it, unloading it and then putting it into lorries and then bringing it all the way here. The cost is simply phenomenal. So it's a good material there, it's a good fuel in West Bengal, but it certainly isn't to be used here in Canada. Um, similarly, with electricity of any sort, um, uh, you've got to have some form of energy power to produce enough. Um, so we've gone all the way from uh, coal, oil, and so on, uh, hydroelectric stuff, uh, water, and of course now there's the big uh, thing about um, nuclear, developing nuclear power. So that is another subject which I don't get on to at this stage. <laughs> but the thing is, we just do not have enough oil or coal in schools of architecture. Um, and um, if we heard of any new, or if the staff knew of any new building that was being put up using a reinforced concrete structure, a frame structure, or anything like that, or a sand, we were all put into the train or a bus, and we went off 100, 200 miles to see this extraordinary new material. It's, it's not as old as I am. And the cement that we use, you know, there are different prescriptions, like doctor's prescriptions for medicines and powders and things. The same for cement, the, uh, how to make it and the different contents and their proportions and so on. Um, the modern, uh, what we call Portland cement, again, that was finalized and fixed on in the Western world. You get to this energy business. Uh, we've got in most parts of India, we've got um, limestone. And in Canada, all along the coast in our backwaters, the backwaters depth of shell deposit at the bottom of the, uh, of the backwater. It's been covered up with um, the silt, the uh, mud there on the spot. And we spend enormous, uh, the one uh, cement factory that we had until comparatively recently, the only cement factory we had in Perla, was not far from Carter there. I used to bring shells or cause shells to be brought from the sea, uh, which is only a mile away, um, to the centre. I'd make a big mud wall like a, uh, around the top of a well with a hole in the bottom uh, of the side, one side. We'd fill it with shells, then we'd put a, like a pie crust of uh, pastry on top, just mud to cover it all up. Just at the bottom, I'd have a hole um, with a little hole here going through. This was all the shells all over, and then the pastry put on top like that. With a bicycle wheel and a blower, and he'd do this to keep this um, charcoal burning until the shells had caught fire and burned. Then you just left it for three days, four days, and it converted itself into kumayam, <coughs> into lime. And uh, then you, uh, we would sift it to get a fine, white, uh, a fine lime. And then um, what didn't go through the sifter, through the mix, <coughs> we'd put it into the next lot. And uh, all the pasta and all that sort of thing that we needed for the whole of uh, seven, eight, nine big buildings. Um, but now, everywhere, people still go on insisting on using um, uh, cement for anything like that. As far as mortar and plaster and so on, the ultimate strength of lime is every bit as good as the um, ultimate strength of cement, mortar or plaster. Um, it's, uh, there's very, very little difference. 
Um, sometimes the cement wins, sometimes it's not being used any longer at all. Hardly at all. A lot of people don't even know what a uh, command, command, what's command, where does it come from? This shirt only has one pocket and I keep putting my chalk here and it goes straight on the floor. Uh, things go stuck. These are the sort of things that I think we should all be looking out for when we're asked to design things or take part in. Um, the first one is, I think we should only accept reasonable briefs. Um, you know, when people ask us to do something that is unreasonable or is obviously going to be very costly or very energy intensive, um, then we should say, uh, you know, we don't want to do it. I know it's easy for me to say that to you when you're just starting your career, uh, and obviously you're only too glad to get any job once you uh, when you come out of college or um, uh, learning. So it's not really very fair. But once you've got your name and once you've got your office and so on and are working, and people know who you are and that you can do things for a certain cost then I think we should be very choosy about what we do and for who. Um, the, uh, we should discourage extravagance and, of course, snobbery. Um, a lot of, even, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but some of the so-called low-cost Larry Baker buildings that are put up by others, um, they will um, do all this patch pointing and use an expensive paint to color the patch so that it's a nice white. Um, they sandpaper the walls and put uh, clear varnish all over to make them nice and shiny and so on. Well, um, this isn't cost reduction. It's using cost redu reduction that it comes into magazines, pictures of uh, our buildings. Uh, but um, doing it for fashion and not on principle. So uh, when it's a fashion business of uh, people being snobs, uh, trying to be better than other people and all that sort of thing, that's not a good reason to accept. So only accept the reasonable uh, thing. And if only we had a saw, we could cut that off. Uh, then in every job that you do, before you even start drawing, um, you should make sure that you know the plot the land, you know what the water situation will be, uh, both availability, where it will come from, and uh, rain and drainage and all that sort of thing, the climate.